Um, I truly do believe that we share the love of Christ. And um, so thank you so much, Aubrey, and your congregation here for allowing us to be with you here tonight. We really appreciate that. Andre, can I say one thing? Oh, you can Just say Just for those one. that speak Chinese, that struggle with English, we do have simultaneous translation services available. So if you would like to, um, they, we have got earpieces that's wireless at the back. You can just put it in, and then it will be translated into Chinese. Amen. There you go. Afrikaans, but we're not going to go there. <laughs> uh, uh, we normally we do translation in Chinese and Japanese. Yeah. Cool. Um, so I'd like to introduce you a person who I just met an hour ago. Um, but as I spoke, I saw so many links to people that we know and people whom we respect throughout the world, South Africa, but especially also in England, and it is Professor Andrew McIntosh, even though most just call him Andy. Um, he's professor at Leeds, at the University of Leeds, and um, he's professor in thermodynamics and compulsion theory. Uh, like I mentioned this morning in our church, he did considerable research and also patent a few interesting patents when it comes to the bombardier beetle. Those of you who don't know, you can ask that question maybe a little bit later. Um, it's a beetle that exists defying everything that we know about, about science and chemistry, but um, that little beetle is held in the hands of God not to explode everywhere it goes. So we're very grateful for people who actually research those things and can speak um, authority with authority about those things. So um, the way in which we're going to do uh, tonight, the first session is going to be um, an explanation from Scripture on why creation matters. And I think for us as believers, that's where we start. We start with the Word. We should always start with the Word. That is how God reveals Himself in nature, but also His special revelation in His Son. So it's great to start there and... Um, then afterwards, we will also give opportunity for some questions. I will start us off with probably one or two questions, um, easy ones, so that you can ask more complicated ones afterwards. And, and then afterwards, we will we'll also have some snacks and tea being served there at the back. So I also want to ask you if you would like to give a love offering um, towards the ministry that Andy is doing please do so as well. Um, we would leave a basket there at the back with the books. You're welcome just to contribute towards that. Um, there are books as well, some of the books that he himself wrote, but also in the wider context, you can have a look at them. We have Ben, ben is responsible for, for taking your money if you want to spend some. Make use of the resources that there are. Then there will also be a list if you would like to get some, some news um, in a newsletter form. From, from Professor McIntosh, you can also get that. So just write your name on the list and he will forward that to you. So with no further ado, brother, come up and I'll pray for you again and, and then we can get going. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, brother. You're welcome. Heavenly Father, I do pray, first of all, for a brother, someone who has been saved by the same precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that flows in our veins, the lovely glorious, most wonderful revelation of God, the Son himself. Thank you that we stand on that solid ground even tonight. And it is our prayer that as we look at the word, that you would speak to us clearly and that you would use your servant tonight to convince us again that our foundation has been clearly set in what you said. And what you said was good and it is good for us. I pray in particular that you would bless uh, Professor McIntosh, as I know he's also struggling with a bit of a cold. You give him the energy to complete this task tonight and speak to us through your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, brother. I'm going to move this slightly this way so it's not under strain. I'm also going to bring this. Could you bring this table up, Andre? Sure. So just put it next to here. Thank you very much. Just next. To you. That's great. I don't want to be responsible in breaking. Yeah, no, it's all right. They're fine. We've got a few fossils on display, including me. But uh, 
So if you want to look at these afterwards, you're welcome. Um, yeah, well, it's really good to be here and uh, lovely to meet two South African brothers because uh, I've just been in South Africa and I know a lot of the places where uh, at least Andre, I've talked with him quite a bit in that first hour. And as Andre said, we had a huge number of connections just in one hour. So it was lovely to meet him. And I'm sure that would be the same with Aubrey as well. <coughs> some great people who are doing some great evangelism in South Africa. And it's a wonderfully open country. And <coughs> I love going there. <coughs> I also like coming to New Zealand. It's a bit of a competition between South Africa and New Zealand as to which is the most beautiful country. Some wonderful spots in South Africa which really just are very compelling. But I don't think anything quite beats Mount Cook and the approach on of it by that lake. I can never remember its name, but really is beautiful. So it's a beautiful part of the world here. Uh, you've got more sheep than people, but... Uh, the people are very important, and we need to stand firm, those of us who are believers, on the Word of God. And that really is my message today. Creation, I will admit, is not of itself a salvation issue. Let that be perfectly plain, made perfectly plain. Because some people from my camp, I don't think they do it deliberately, but they just give an impression in the way that they speak. I'm not naming any names, because I'm sure I've done it. Right? But you can actually give the impression to somebody who's heard the talk. He said, well, he was saying that in order to become a Christian, we've got to believe in creation. And 6,000 years old, six literal day creation. I'm not saying that. In fact, my own testimony is that I didn't think these issues through until I had become a Christian. So my own testimony is that someone asked me when I was a 16, 17-year-old coming 70, I asked me whether I was uh, a Christian. I said, I hoped I was, or words like that. He knew I wasn't, and he explained to me that I needed to admit that I'd done wrong. I needed to believe that Jesus Christ had died personally on the cross for me. And thirdly, C, I needed to commit my life to Christ. That night, I understood for the first time, and I remember thinking, I've been to all these religious meetings, even Billy Graham crusades, and not understood what a Christian was. And I thank God for that person who's still alive who asked me that question. That I needed to admit that I was a sinner. I needed to believe that Jesus Christ died for me. And thirdly, I needed to commit my life to Christ. That is the most important matter. Basically, he was leading me to Christ and to be born again. That night, I committed my life to Christ. I admitted I was a sinner. I believed that Jesus died in my place. And I thirdly, committed my life to Christ. I handed over the keys, as it were, of the, the, um, the car <clears throat> of my life, and the driver was now the Lord. doesn't mean that I didn't make mistakes. Of course, I made a huge number of mistakes. But I was basically saved that night. And I felt like I'd had a bath on the inside on the next morning. You know, I felt like I was clean. And I wanted to read my Bible. I wanted to pray, and I wanted to be with other Christians. So, creation of itself is not a salvation issue, but it became an issue as I went to university. The leader of the Christian Union said, have you thought about these issues? And I, I must admit I hadn't. And he gave me one or two books, which were the only books available in those days. I am sort of rather ancient. And those days, we only had Genesis Flood by Henry Morris and John Whitcomb, The Early Earth, and also The World That Perished. It was the last book that particularly impressed me. And both the, the lady who was going to become my wife and myself realized that Genesis had to be true right from the word go. You cannot be saying that it's only true a bit later on. It's got to be straightforwardly true. So what is the issue? Well, with, as with any iceberg, it's what's underneath. The hidden dangers are not immediately obvious, but they are definitely there. Mixing evolution and genesis, even though I've said it's not a salvation issue, may cause shipwreck and has caused shipwreck to a number of young people in particular. Because what tends to happen is they have a schizophrenic mentality where they hear the gospel here 
And I trust that Aubrey actually will teach Genesis. But many churches, they just hear the gospel and they hear the greatness of what Christ has done. That's all tremendous. But they don't, they haven't had any Bible teaching about the relevance of the Bible to issues like creation and the world outside. And so they go to university and they hear all sorts of things which say, look, this is reality. We've been here for millions of years. We've evolved from apes. And they then think that that's true and that being in church, it, which they'll still do for a while, they'll do just for their parents' sake. But in the end, they're drifting away. And then they get an invitation to some party or other. Immorality comes in and they're beginning to say, no, I don't believe anything of the Bible. This is often the track record of young people. And so I would encourage you to regard this as very important. Having said that it's not a creation, a, a, a salvation issue, it is an issue concerning biblical authority. Because if the Bible isn't authoritative, when it touches, agreed it's not primarily a history book, but it definitely touches on history. And indeed, salvation is all part of a historical timeline. The Bible, if you think about it, is the only book, there is no other book, which has a timeline which runs all the way through from the beginning even to the end. It tells you where we've come from. It tells you how the nations were formed after Babel. It tells you about the flood before that. It tells you everything you need to know in terms of the framework, not all the detail, but the framework of where we've come from. And, of course, it's setting the scene for the fact that the Lord would eventually send his own son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to bleed and to die on the cross, just like he had prophesied in Genesis 3.15 that the seed of the woman would bruise the serpent's head. And eventually, the seed of the woman came. Now, that is the gospel in a nutshell. You cannot remove the gospel from its historical basis. So the religion that is now believed by most people in Europe, the USA, sadly, Australia, New Zealand, and as you can tell, I'm more in the Northern Hemisphere, <coughs> but it's true here, sadly, that this is the religion which is propounded and pushed. It's pushed now in South Africa. It's pushed even in some uh, very conservative nations like Kenya. I was appalled as to how much is, it's being pushed even in some Christian organized, um, Christian organized universities in Nigeria, I was astounded when I actually came across a university which has been set up by a large denomination in Nigeria and they were already teaching evolution. I said, that's going to be the downfall of this university if you carry on doing that in the name of the Christian faith. It's one thing to have secular universities doing it, it's quite another to have Christians. So I was appalled at that. So look, what are the four things which actually show to us that this is hugely important? I'm going to run through them. There is a theology issue, no death before the fall. There is a theology issue, creation was by God's word. Then the ones, the latter ones in a different color, they are really more exegetical issues and they're more to do with historical issues, particularly the last one about the flood. So let's just briefly think about these. There was no death before the fall. Now, when you actually come to the New Testament, it's interesting, it's the new, not so much the old, which makes it plain that there was no death before the fall. Now, I'm well aware that there is a whole host of Christians who disagree with me. And by the way, I do try to be gracious with those who disagree with me. And there are a good number, right? They don't like what I say. They even are on the verge of cancelling meetings because I stand on a 6,000-year creation. I may believe in a young earth creation because I know that that's what the Bible teaches. They don't always cancel, but sometimes they do. And I'm well aware that there is a price to pay because so many Christians want to have their cake and eat it. That's basically what's going on. They don't want to be thought of as wildly off the wall. But it isn't off the wall. This is what Christians have believed for centuries. Evolution is not science. Evolution is a religion posing as science. That's what's really happened. 
And the Bible makes it plain that the wages of sin is death. Well, that's either true or it isn't. The Bible says that when we sin, it brings death. Who was the first person to sin? Adam. So that therefore means that there was no death before the fall. Well, that in one fell swoop removes any idea of evolutionary survival of the fittest, of creatures moving up to eventually man coming on the scene. A very well-known evangelical whom I won't name, because this may be being taped. A well-known evangelical whose name is revered right across the world, before he died, put over the idea that God could have taken some sort of homo divinus or some creature which is moving up to becoming human and called that person or that creature homo divinus. Now, this is hugely damaging because when you've got leading evangelicals saying that, We've got to stand up and be counted. That doesn't mean I'm saying that that good gentleman who's written many books which helped me uh, is a, not a believer. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that there are issues here. We need to stand on the word of God. The gift of God, of course, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Evolution says death must have always been there. Sorry about the cartoon, but it makes a point pretty quickly. So evolution is saying that some ape-like creature busy coming down from the trees eventually moves onto the scene and as I've just said you know people say that God took some sort of creature like that do you know the world laughs at that view the secular scientists think that it's utterly ridiculous to bring God into the picture they have no respect for the what's called the theistic evolutionary view they actually don't respect this view and you'll find that the secular atheists are far more afraid of the young Earth's position than they are of anything else. They said, these are the guys you need to watch, those who believe in a young Earth. And they deride me, they deride Stuart Burgess, who's another kind gentleman from England. They deride many people who are speaking on creation. Creation, of course, says that man's actions brought death. Genesis 1 has running through it, all the way through, that it was good. I find this very fascinating because there are six initially and then it's the seventh. He says that light is good, the land and the sea are good, the plants and trees are good, the light bearers are good, which, by the way, come on for fourth day. People have problems with that, but God can bring light without the sun and the moon. That's not a problem. What on earth was he doing on the Mount of Transfiguration? you've immediately got a case where light is produced without the sun and the moon. It's frankly absurd to make that an issue. God is well able to do what he wants, and he produced light without the sun and the moon. Could have been the light from him himself, we don't know. We just have to leave it. But he's well able to do it. And if you're still worried, what's going to happen when you actually get to heaven, into the new heavens and the new earth, which is a physical place... We're going to be resurrected into the new heavens and new earth. You should be praising God at that thought. It's a wonderful thought. At the day of resurrection, you're going to have a new body and you're going to enter. Eventually, people have different views as to how, what's going to happen. Let's not go there. But eventually, there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. And it specifically says the lamb is the light of that place and there is no need of the sun. Do you see? Revelation 21, verse 23. Everything was very good is the last one. And it's, it's underlining everything that's been said underneath, uh, uh, above, rather. God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. 1 Corinthians 15 makes it also plain that as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. It couldn't be clearer. Adam brings death, Christ brings life. So I think you'll agree with me that the biblical teaching of the origin of death is that man actually fell and that there is no doubt that this includes physical death because he says, unto dust you will return. Let's move on to the second point. Maybe I'll just say one last thing on this first point. Not that I want you to write everything down, but I'm just going to put this whole slide up, not comment on it all, but I just want you to see 
that the cross, and I'm just going to want you to see that these last four sayings summarize something which is very much connected with Genesis. That's a very busy slide. You're welcome to take a picture of it. I see some of you are. Because it summarizes the seven sayings on the cross. And it's actually a very significant matter when you do the study. Because you find out that the Lord Jesus Christ goes on the cross at 12 o'clock noon. Sorry, at 9 o'clock, I beg him home. 9 o'clock, third hour, from 6 o'clock in the morning. Then, after the conversations have taken place, and he wasn't crucified on a hill far away. He was crucified in a thoroughfare. It's evident from when you see the descriptions. The Romans were past masters at saying, this is what happens to you if you defy the state. They crucify people in thoroughfares. Some people think it was close to where Jerusalem bus station is today. It may well have been. It was in a thoroughfare. And the people were talking to him, saying, if you're the Christ, come down off the cross, and all this talk. Horrible stuff. And the two thieves either side were mocking him as well. Then at the ninth hour, everything goes black. And just before that, the Lord Jesus has saved one of the thieves on the cross who's realized who it is. Marvelous teaching here, of course, about salvation. But then there's nothing said for three hours of darkness. Because we clearly have it written, Mark 15, 34, at the ninth hour, and this is repeated in Mark 15, Jesus says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He's taking the spiritual penalty for sin. The spiritual aspect of death is being taken. Why do I stress that? Because the theistic evolutionists, the people who believe that God used evolution, say, well, that was the penalty in the garden. And they're right to a certain extent, but it's not totally right. The penalty in the garden was that in the day that you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. The wages of sin is death. The penalty in the garden was twofold. Immediately, Adam experienced spiritual death, separation from fellowship with God. 900 odd years later, that which had already begun, which was a principle of physical death, had its full effect, and Adam died. Now you see how it all comes together at the cross. Because Jesus says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's the spiritual separation from his father. Something which will never happen again, but you're in danger of if you don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. He then says, I thirst, and this time he takes of the vinegar, which he, earlier he hadn't taken. This is the second occasion where he says, I will take it because he wasn't going to dull the pain of taking our sins. He then cries, it is finished, which is one word in the Greek, tetelesti, and he thundered it from the cross. He was the one person in control of all the events at the cross. I'll repeat that. The person who was in control of all the events that took place at the cross was not Pilate, was not Caiaphas, it wasn't the soldiers, it was Christ. Let that sink into your ears and your minds. Christ is utterly glorious even in death. He is the one who sustains all things by the word of his power, Hebrews 1. He is the one who can, in a moment, we'll see in a bit later, he can calm a storm. When you grasp that there is no death before the fall, now see where this goes. If Jesus has dealt with just one aspect of death, and it's only one, why didn't he get off the cross? Because the sense saying says, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And he bowed his head, and he gave up the ghost. John 19, verse 30, could perhaps be better translated, he bowed his head and dismissed his spirit, because he was in control of his own death. No man takes it from me. I lay down my life, and I take it again. Remember, Jesus is 
just as glorious in death as he is in life. Now, when you grasp this, do you see that the penalty for sin has to include physical death? Because otherwise, why did Jesus go through physical death for me? Theistic evolution is flawed, F-L-A-W-E-D, flawed, because it cannot explain why Jesus physically died on the cross, because the cross makes it plain that the penalty for sin includes physical death. Why? Because that's what happened in the Garden of Eden. There was no physical death before the fall. Friends, the theology is immensely important. Creation, though, was also by God's word. All the way through Genesis 1, it says, and God said, and God said. And then it says, there was, or it was so. Whichever translation you use, it doesn't really matter to me. It's the original words that matter. God said, God said, it was so, it was so, it was so. Now, was that a long period of time? I suggest not. Who was doing the speaking? Well, actually, we come to the New Testament and it immediately tells you. Colossians chapter 1 says, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by (laughs) By him were all things made, uh, all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, and so on. It also says in Hebrews 1, By whom also he made the worlds. If you're still not convinced, turn to John chapter 1, which isn't up there. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the word was God. And then it goes on to say in verse 3, All th- without him was not, anything, was not anything made that was made. Couldn't be clearer. Well, are you saying then, Andy, that God the Father and God the Holy Spirit are not involved? No, I'm not saying that. Because you can't separate out the Trinity. The way to understand this, dear friends, is to look at Hebrews 1 again, which says that he is the full expression of the Father. Wherever people met Christ, they were really meeting God the Father as well. Because it's the delight of God the Father to always have Christ preeminent, both in creation, in redemption, in the resurrection, in every single event. The glory of the Trinity is to always elevate Christ. The Holy Spirit doesn't want particularly to be drawn attention to. He is sometimes called the Spirit of Christ. God the Father, of course, is God the Father and the Jesus Christ submitted himself to God the Father, and he was also driven by the Spirit into the wilderness. So he always had dealings with the other persons of the Trinity. But it was the delight, and is the delight, Colossians 1 teaches, of the Trinity to give glory to the Lord Jesus. So when we understand that, and when we understand that through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, the conclusion is inescapable that the one who is primarily doing the speaking in Genesis 1 is Christ and he's speaking the word. How long did it take for the Lord Jesus to do these miracles which I said I'd mention? We'll just pick out one in Mark 4. The lake of Galilee in a storm where the disciples looking at their watches saying, the Lord, the storm still hasn't calmed. You know they weren't. Immediately Jesus said the words, peace be still. There was a great calm. The wind ceased. How long did it take for the sick of the palsy to get up in Mark 2? How long did it take for Lazarus, a dead man, to get out of the grave in John 11? Even dead men have to obey him. And if you're still not convinced... Look at John 5, 28 and 29, which talks in a horrific way about the resurrection of life and the resurrection of damnation. And it talks about both groups of people responding to the word of God who will bring the resurrection. I tell you, friends, we're dealing with weighty matters when we see that all this is linked with creation. Once you know that it's Christ, once you know that it's the word of God, 2,000 years ago, there was no millions of years involved. There was no process. He just did miracles immediately. Well, what's the implication? Back in Genesis 1, 
He was doing exactly the same. He spoke, the light was switched on. I, my conviction, I can't prove it, is that he made electromagnetic radiation on day one. Light is part of an electromagnetic spectrum. And electromagnetism is absolutely essential for even matter like this to exist. All molecules have balances of forces. A lot of them are empty. In fact, most molecules are completely empty, except for the energy particles revolving around each other. We don't understand it until in the last 20, 30 years. Physicists have been going, delving deeper and deeper into it. It's all to do with electromagnetic connections. I won't go into detail, obviously, because I'm not saying that I know that's the case. But God switched on the light. God switched on the firmament, the expanse between the waters above and the waters beneath. God made the flowers and the trees. God put the sun and the moon and the stars in place. And I love the way it says, and he made the stars also. All ten <coughs> raised to the power 22 of them. Such that the fastest computers can't even count the Milky Way stars let alone all the other galaxies full of stars in one lifetime. Even the fastest computer can't do it. The mind boggles, but such is the greatness, as we were singing earlier, of our God. If we start saying it's millions of years, what are you going to do with the end? Are you going to say it's going to take millions of years to wind up the universe? You read Psalm 102 and read Hebrews 1. And you'll find that the Lord is saying he's going to roll up the universe like you roll up a garment. It'll be over in a moment. When Jesus comes, the stars will fall from heaven and it'll all be over. Just in one moment. He doesn't need millions of years. And you diminish the power of Christ if you say he does. He didn't do it that way. Adam was made from dust. This is a brief one, but it's an important one. I can show you from the Bible that there is no pre-existing living creatures that God made Adam from. That person whom I'm not going to name was wrong because he hadn't read carefully both Genesis 1 verse 6, which clearly says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. That doesn't prove it. Perhaps he did read them, but he, he certainly didn't draw out the truth from these, that in Genesis 2 verse 7, it says... God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. That still doesn't prove it, but it does show you that man is different. But of course, Genesis 2, which expands on Genesis 1, talks about the creation of the wonderful first woman, which must have been wonderful for Adam to see. Now, Eve was not made from pre-existing living creatures except Adam. She was made out of the side of Adam. You end up with real problems. If you're going to say that some pre-Adamic creatures or pre-Eve creatures were both evolving some sort of sexual changes which would be more human-like, sorry, changes which would make their sexual features more human-like, the whole thing doesn't fit. But the verse which really clinches it is Genesis 3, verse 19. Because it says, after the fall, dust you are and unto dust, your return. How can that mean anything but literal dust? You know as well as I do that when somebody dies, they go to literal dust. So, when it says in the same phrase that you were made from dust, it must mean that he was made from literal dust. Let me come to the last point, and that's this which is the flood. Now, this is the one it probably causes the most aggravation. But once you get these four doctrines in place, everything else begins to fit. But you've got to come with a biblical mindset. So I'm appealing to you as Christians to accept that the Bible is the authority and not try to skirt round it. Genesis 7 says, at the time of the flood, the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Now, almost invariably, those who say that God used evolution, and remember, I'm not saying that they're not believers, but I'm saying that they've got a weak view of Scripture. 
They haven't got the high view of Scripture which we should have. And I, I'm open to be corrected. There's probably things that I need to be told. You know, We must always be subject to the Word of God. And if someone finds something that I've quoted incorrectly, I must be the first to acknowledge it. Or if I've not thought through something properly. I'm saying humility before the Word of God is essential. The high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Does that mean a local flood like that? With a wall of water? Well, obviously it doesn't. Well, did it mean that there was a basin created by mountains and that there was just an area within those mountains that was covered? We've got a big problem. That would mean that the mountains right at the edge were not covered by definition. So you've got a, you've got a contradiction straight away. Plus the fact... What's the point of building an ark when all you've got to do is move Noah plus his family and the creatures to beyond that location? Nah, doesn't make sense. What's the point of building an ark when one can simply move? But if you're still not convinced by that, now consider what happened after the flood. Now, this is significant. Just recently in England, we sometimes get these amazing rainbows. And we saw a semicircular rainbow go right across the Pennine Mountains. It's really beautiful. And sometimes you get a double rainbow if it's a very bright rainbow. It goes red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, and then it goes in reverse for the second. It's really beautiful. And God says why he'd made a rainbow. He says... And evidently, it hadn't rained to the extent, I'm not saying it didn't rain, some people on the web love to pull me apart because they completely misconstrue what I've said uh, on this point about rain. Clearly, the rain was not as powerful until the time of the flood. There was a mist, but probably no rainbow. But after the flood, there were stormy conditions and rainbows. And Jesus says, or God says, it should be a token of a covenant between me and the earth, and the water shall no more become a flood to destroy the earth. Okay, does that mean a local flood will never happen again? We can immediately prove that that cannot be the case. December the 26th, 2004, the Boxing Day tsunami killed one quarter of a million people almost in one day. It was a major, major disaster. Some of you may remember it. In Sendai, in 2011, tsunami came in and swept many people to their deaths. And then Malawi and other places, you all know that local floods have been going on ever since the time when, Jesus, when God said that in Genesis 9. So it cannot mean a local flood will never happen again. What God is saying is that there will never be a worldwide flood again, and there never has been. People argue and say, ah, where did all that water come from? They are failing to realize the immensity of the flood. It's very evident when you read 2 Peter chapter 3, and I'll just pull that up here with this, this summary of the genealogies from Adam to Noah, but it actually says in 2 Peter chapter 3 that the world that then was perished. Um, sorry, it's not actually in the wording there, but it's actually in that passage, 2 Peter chapter 3. Um, <coughs> and three times it refers to the word of God. The word of God brings creation. Then it says, whereby the world that then was perished. And then thirdly, it says, by the same word, the heavens are reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and lostness or perdition of ungodly men. So 2 Peter 3 makes it abundantly plain that Christ and his return is linked with the flood, which was also global. The Lord himself does it in Luke 17. It says... As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. You can't escape it. 
The New Testament in particular is saying that the worldwide flood was indeed worldwide. Well, many people, of course, think this is just too radical. We cannot possibly do this, Andy. Where am I going to be if I stand up at the university? You're just going to be the same person as you were yesterday. What do you think Daniel thought when he was at the university in Babylon and he refused to eat the king's meat? Do you think that he was any different before than after? Actually, he was better after because he wouldn't eat of the king's meat and he wouldn't drink of the king's drink. The principle is very obvious. We need to stand up and be Daniels in our university institutions. I don't mean that we should be unloving, and particularly we must be loving with Christians who don't decide to go that route. We don't go around calling them heretics and stuff like that. That would do a lot of damage. But you say, as Joshua did, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So I'm calling you, if you're a young person here, doing geology, biology, doing the sciences, think it through, guys. The Bible has given you a framework of history. It's not for us to alter that framework. So you come to the science. Well, I love fossils. We've got lots of fossils in the UK. These are not from the UK. This one is not. But these ones are. This is from the UK. It's an ammonite from Whitby, where Captain Cook came from, who eventually found New Zealand and a few other places, and put the Union Jack there, you know, did all the good things. Uh, quite rightly. Um, but then he ended up in Hawaii, and we know what happened. But Captain Cook sailed from Whitby, and these are very close to Whitby, and they're found. And they're evidently squashed very quickly as this... Fish has been squashed exceedingly quickly. This is um, I was, yeah, a shrimp. This is a shrimp, which has got so much detail on it that you can even see the sort of whisker that shrimps have, also fossilized. When creatures die in the ocean today, they don't fossilize. They become food for other creatures. The very fact that we've got fossils all the way through the sedimentary rock indicates catastrophe. It's not millions of years, guys. The coal that we find, which is ubiquitous right across the world, indicates that it has to be young. And I'll tell you why. Because coal, high rank carbon content coal, that means high percentage of coal, it's carbon content. So something above 70% is never formed just by leaving lots of vegetation just sort of out in the wild and just the sun and the rain. You just get peat. You don't get coal. How come we've got coal right across the world? Coal is a particularly powerful demonstration of the fact that the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. A lot of vegetation had been scoured from the earlier surface of the world and was dumped onto the new land which was now appearing. There was no New Zealand before the flood. You'll be pleased to know there was no Australia either. <laughs> so no West Island just bothering you, you know. And there was no British Empire before the flood, you'll be pleased to know. Neither the American Empire. Almost certainly, those land masses moved with the tectonic plates. I have no problem with that, but not slowly, fast. There was a massive splitting of the Earth's crust. A water came up from underneath the world that then was and covered the world. We don't know what the landmass was. We think that possibly it was just one great big landmass. Call it Gondwana land if you wish. But that land split open. And all the creatures and people were buried who didn't get into the ark. That's the message of Genesis 6 to 9. That's the message of 2 Peter 3. 
That's the message of Luke 17. Then the world that now is began to form at the end of the flood. So these tectonic plates, I suggest, I can't prove this, were actually pushing against one another. So it's well known that India is pushing against the Eurasian plate and pushed up the Himalayas, which, by the way, are full of Ammonites. Did you know that? At 12,000 feet on the Deccan Plains, before you go up 12,000 feet, for those of you not familiar with feet, um, the imperial measure, of course, uh, you should be smiling, but see, you're not picking up my little jibes. Um, uh, 12,000 feet, it's 4,000 meters, right? Well, it's another 5,000 meters to get to the top of Everest. But there at 4,000 meters, the Deccan Plain is littered with Ammonites. Where did they come from? Well, they were originally underwater before they were pushed up. And then the mountains of K2 uh, and all the other Himalayas and Everest and all of them, <coughs> which, which are essentially sedimentary rocks, were pushed up. The Andes were pushed up. The Rocky Mountains were pushed up. The Alps were pushed up towards the end of the flood. That's what most of us think. And it does seem to strongly fit with the evidence. So, friends, I'm going to leave it there because I know you want to have a time of questions. There's so much more I could say, and I could give you evidence on design, evidence on the fossils, which I have begun to do. Let me just mention one thing just as we close. If you notice, I haven't talked about days. Once you've got those four things in place, the days is a minor issue. Because why would you want to be believe that God used evolution when you've already established that creation was by God's word, and that there was no death before the fall, that Adam was not made from pre-existing creatures but from dust, and that you know that there was a worldwide flood. So why go there? Well, just in case you still go there, the exegesis of Yom in the days of creation is very clearly a six-day, literal day, creation. The yom is used with a number. Day number one, day number two, is the way that the counting goes. Wherever you get yom with a day count, it always means a 24-hour day. And it's also got evening and morning. Wherever you get evening and morning with the word yom, or evening on its own, or morning on its own, it always means 24-hour day. So actually, the exegesis is very clear that there is no gradual, long periods of time. It's true that the word day can mean a long period of time, and it's used in that way in Genesis 2, where there's no number and there's no evening and morning. And it just says in the day that... So what's the other point? Well, we know that it's 6,000 years of true history which is actually implied in Genesis 5 and Genesis 11. It's very difficult to actually put in extra names into Genesis 5. Even if you were to do so, you couldn't increase those periods between Adam to Noah by more than just a few hundred years at the very most. Adam to Noah is roughly a thousand years till his birth. Noah to Abraham is roughly another thousand years. Abraham to David is roughly another thousand years. And David to Christ is a thousand years. So creation was roughly, I'm not worried about exact dates, but it's roughly 6,000 years ago. I have no problem with that. The evidence fits. I appeal to you to be counted on the basis of believing in the scriptures. Let's open it up for questions. There may be, I'm sure, lots of scientific issues you want to raise. I would just like to start us off with a question and then I'll open up, up yeah, to the floor. Feel free. Um, 
And mine seems to have gone now? off, or maybe it's come yes. back on. Okay, good, good. Um, for, many, for many of us, we are bombarded with so-called scientific evidence that seems to be yeah. pointing that everything that we read in the Bible is really fairy tales and fables and, yeah. and, and old and outdated. We live in a post-Christian world. So, so in, in, in the world of apologetics, when, when our people go to universities or maybe even in school or wherever we are, we are confronted with this, with this whole idea um, that we need to be as clever as they are scientifically, supposedly, mm -hmm. in order to, to convince them of the truth. So in other words, how much science do we need in order to answer these questions? Yeah. Um, and if you, would, if you would encourage us with, because I really like what you've done tonight, you've done, you've done what I believe actually, is, is the word of God is the ultimate authority of all things. So, so just the balance between science and the word and when there are seemingly contradictions sometimes, I, I use that word deliberately, seemingly, um, how do we deal with that in the world in which our young people are moving in? They feel threatened, um, they feel sometimes overwhelmed because um, they do not have those answers. How would you encourage them how to deal with that? Well, I'm going to put the question back to you. No, no. No, I am. <laughs> no, you're going to stay there. <laughs> And I'd also have Pastor Aubrey up here if he's around. But both of you as pastors have a massive responsibility to teach systematically Genesis to the current generation. If you don't do that, you are missing a mark. And I believe it's vital that all pastors systematically teach the first 11 chapters of Genesis. But having said that, of course, that doesn't answer fully the question. And I realize that. But in that context, then, questions will be raised with you as pastors. And I think it behoves pastors in particular to know where to find answers. So, although I'm going to say now some answers to your question, I'm actually saying seriously that you in particular need to have a list of places to go such that you can then direct young people to say, it's not an issue here. It'll take a bit of reading, but you can find answers to your questions. Mm. And the big websites are um, creation.com, which is Creation Ministries International, which has an office here. The other one is answersingenesis.org. And those are the two reliable creation organizations, which I would always point people to first. <coughs> you, do get, you do get other people of course, and sometimes they produce some very good material. I'm not decrying some of that, but you have to sift through it carefully. But <coughs> almost invariably, AIG, Answers in Genesis, and Creation.com, Creation Ministries International, are very thoughtful in the way they give answers. So if it's on starlight and time, which is always an issue, and the person is doing physics, there are suggested answers. We haven't sorted it all out. We don't claim to have done on the issue of the geology. The geology is a very easy one in my view to deal with because I've just mentioned carbon found right across the world in coal and the only way you can get that is by rapid burial. But also there's things like carbon-14 which is a very quickly decaying substance which is found significantly in not just coal but found in fossilized wood, found in also, even in dinosaur bones, which are meant to be 65 million years old. So I find the geology of all things the most easiest to answer. Mm. The geology is clearly telling me worldwide flood. The, the question on the stars is more difficult. I don't think any of us are going to actually resolve that fully because none of us can really do experiments to test out the hypothesis. But the biggest hypothesis was which I think has got mileage in it, is Ross Humphreys, who takes the view that, and he's right on this, that the Big Bang hypothesis has massive problems with it, which it does, because it has a light travel problem of its own. If people want to know, I can tell them later. But if you say that there is a natural center to the universe, and there are some indications that there is, and that the Milky Way is not far away from that center, it changes everything. Mm. You get clocks going at different rates, 
and no big bang theorist wants that. He hates that idea. But that, I think, is where the answer lies. Cool. Right, well, I'll open it up. Um, can we move this mic around, Aubrey, or is it, can I, if? There's another one in the back here. So if any of those in the back, anyone? Okay. So if anyone, anyone has, an an has an answer, that's a question. <laughs> please, just, please just raise your hand and we'll bring this to you if you don't mind. Um, you want me to switch? Yeah, yeah, it's going. Yeah. Must be. Doesn't like Englishmen. No, it doesn't like Actually all those well. comments about Captain Cook. It's got a new bar there. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, you want to ask a question? Yes, feel free. Yeah, um, my name is Shin. Yeah, I uh, just have some few questions. Maybe it be sound really stupid, but yeah, I just get a bit old anyway. Um, first thing is, I just want to know. Uh, I think you've been giving this talk a lot. And I just want to know uh, about your audience. What, how many percentage are they are uh, all Christian? What I want to know is like, um, I don't know. most of them, uh, do, do you normally give talk to like Christian organization or no. all over the place? No, <laughs> I university? obviously, it de depends who I'm speaking to. I was told that I was speaking to primarily Christians tonight. Okay. So my talk was appealing to Christians to believe their book, right? But if I've got a whole host, as I will do on Tuesday at 6.30 in the University of Auckland, um, unconverted people, and I did also on Friday, right? What was your just, just a minute. Yeah. I, won't, I won't do this talk because obviously they're not even on the page in saying that they believe in this book, right? So my talk today is explicitly for a Christian. I'm saying if you're a Christian, then you need to believe the book. And you need to have a framework which is biblical to look at the science. And actually, the science fits beautifully. It doesn't go against what the Bible says, contrary to what all the evolutionists say. Okay? Now, on Tuesday, if you want to come, by the way, you're welcome. I'm speaking on the subject of a sceptical look at atheism. And I'm obviously attacking the atheist position. I'm not going to go into the age of the earth. But I'm going to show that atheism cannot even get the science going. Abiogenesis is a nonsense, right? You can't form life from non-life with lots of DNA. DNA is information, or it supports information. Then I'm going to say that uh, atheism cannot answer where mind comes from, rationality. Thirdly, I'm going to say that atheism cannot give meaning, ultimately, to anything. Cannot give a reason why you're here. And thirdly, fourthly, atheism, supremely, can't give an ethical base, which leads into the gospel. And God has blessed that talk to unconverted right across the UK, quite a number of people in the US. I did it in South Africa at Hillcrest in Durban, and people were flocking who were not Christians to find out more. Okay. So depending who I'm speaking to, I will have different talks. Yeah, nice to know. And the secondly, now, since, since you're like, since all we, like at least people in here, like we, we all have faith, yeah. And we do believe in Christian. Yeah. It's like somebody, but yeah, some, some people wouldn't, but yeah. Um, would it, for those people, if they actually wanted to get into like, like scientists, I mean science subject that actually needs some sort of, um, ask the, answer the question, the need, need evolution, what, what, what were they going to do? Well, how, how are they going to be able to get around it? I'm I mean, sorry, I, I'm not quite following you. Are you saying that people who are Christians yeah. are struggling with the issue? Well, that's common. I mean, uh, for example, like, uh, I studied geology, right? Yes. In university. And 
evolution was part of the of subject. Of course it was. And if I, I was, to, I had really, um, I actually had to separate my study and faith altogether because it, it just gave me a whole lot of um, confusion in between. I understand that, but there is, it may have worked as a pragmatic argument while you did your study, but you now need to go back there and join the dots because otherwise it will sow a seed of doubt for your future growth as a Christian. I understand the pressures, and I have no, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not going around with an unkind word for young people who are standing in a very difficult environment today, much worse than when I was at university, which was decades ago, right? But I'm saying that having done what you've just said, which is sort of, you had a split mentality over it, now you need to join the dots as a Christian. You need to go back to Genesis and say, well, what does it mean? How do I fit this together? Because the Bible certainly is history, as I've just been showing you. And I'm saying that the only way to join it is to say that there wasn't evolution. There was variation of dogs. There was variation even of humans. But there wasn't evolution. You haven't got reptiles changing to birds, which is what they actually teach. And I'm an aerodynamicist, and I know full well that that is utter nonsense. Right? Well, obviously, in an evolutionary biology course, they're looking for particular answers. And you're not wrong to say that Fred, 1983, believed in this, you know, somebody else believed this, you know, and somebody else wrote that, and do all the references you're meant to do. And you can, if you wish, say, that's just their view, but you'll probably get marked down for doing that. But at least if you put in the quotes, they usually will accept it. You don't need to say that you believe in it, right? So I, I accept that there is sometimes a pragmatism which has to come in. But you don't need to lie. You just simply don't say what you really do believe. And plenty of people are doing that in England. And they're quietly coming through the ranks. And they'll reveal themselves as professors of biology. I know one in particular who's doing this. And he'll put his head over the parapet over the right time. And he'll get fired at but because he does such good work, nobody's going to actually remove him. <coughs> Dinosaurs Sorry. seem to have been something that's come on the stage in a big way. Um, how do you answer you know, all these bones and everything that are so-called found in strange places? Yeah, I have no problem with dinosaurs. Obviously, um, they existed. They were made on day six. They went onto the ark, but not an ark like the bathtub, which is sometimes shown in people's books of young people in particular. We make a mockery by showing uh, you know, giraffes coming through the portals and elephants, trunks and stuff. That makes a lot of problems. Dinosaurs went onto an ark, which was 150 meters long, which was 25 meters wide and 15 meters tall. That is huge. That is two Boeing 747s long. So you get a Boeing 747, it's about 75 meters or thereabouts. You could get two of them end to end in the length of an arc, of the arc. So did dinosaurs go on the arc? No problem. There was three stories. The big ones would obviously go on the lower story. He wouldn't put them on the top story. That would be obvious that you don't do that. And the dinosaurs then came off the ark afterwards. They died out. But I think they took a long while to die out. There is evidence that people were seeing these large creatures in China, even in England. There are drawings of these large creatures. There's drawings in Germany. Uh, there is memories in Wales of, um, in the flag. You've got a dragon in the flag. Where does that come from? Now, I'm not saying that these are direct proofs, but it's not surprising, is it? Where does the Swedish legend of Beowulf fighting a dragon come from? 
Where does St. George in England fighting a dragon, where does that come from? I suggest that they were real events. They've been obviously trumped up as very big events, but they probably weren't that major, but they did happen. So dinosaurs were not 65 million years ago. They're not prehistoric creatures. They're creatures which now we don't have. Like the emu, you don't have. But we did have it. It became extinct. The American pigeon became extinct. The dodo became extinct. The dinosaurs have become extinct. So that's my answer to the issue of dinosaurs. Good evening. As you mentioned before about design, um, once I've seen a, a conversation uh, in a video between uh, Ray Comfort and uh, the scientist and atheist uh, Lawrence Krauss, and um, the discussion uh, take out the comparison between a book that needs a designer in order to be written and uh, the DNA. But as you said before, it's uh, uh, a list of information, uh, a huge list of information. And why the, the scientists, they do not say that's actually design, but it's apparent design. So what do you think about that and how would you answer it? Did, what was the word you used? Appearance of design, was it? Yes. Okay. Um, well, I think they're wrong. <laughs> Just plain wrong. Um, design for an engineer is immediately obvious. Um, when you look at birds, the design of a feather is overwhelmingly an engineering marvel because there are hooks and ridges at the microscopic level, which keep the barbs of a feather together. The evolutionist tries to argue, this is just one example, that the, the frayed scales of some reptile became a feather. Well, he's got a major problem because scales grow in different locations than feathers. Feathers grow in follicles. Scales don't grow in follicles. Feathers grow in a sheath coming out of the follicle. And what's more, the DNA has the information in it to actually make sure that the right-handed barbs have, against every barb, every single barb, right-handed barbules, which are different to the left-handed barbules. And the evolutionist hasn't got a clue as to where that came from, because he cannot, by definition, invoke the idea, well, we need those barbules, which aren't quite right yet, but, but just hold on to that, please, because we're going to use them. He can't do that. So this is an illustration of irreducible complexity. And that's the argument that I would use with an evolutionist who has an open mind. Most of them don't but there are some who do. Might be he coined the phrase irreducible complexity. I believe he's right. There are things which will not work unless everything is in place together. And flight is a particularly, particular evidence of that. Thank you. Maybe one more question. Uh, good evening. Professor McIntosh, I have a question. So for archaeologists, um, is there a globally well-accepted um, testing method to verify uh, archaeologists' findings? Because nowadays we often see some statements for, or articles say human history can be easily traced back to more than 10,000 years ago. So how shall we look at this? And do you think they are making a false statement? Thank you. With archaeology, what you need to get is the DVD out there, which is $20, 20 New Zealand dollars, called Patterns of Evidence, and it's all on the archaeology. And it shows that there is ample evidence that Moses came out of Egypt with the children of Israel. There's ample evidence of the invasion of Joshua 
and the children of Israel in the land. When you get that time scale right, then the Egyptian time scale is shown to be wrong. And it's the Egyptian time scale which modern archaeologists are using incorrectly to justify 10,000 years or more. I'm going to have to leave it there. I'm not feeling too well. I'm going to have to sit down. Extra mile, we appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, let us let us pray, and uh, I just want to want to thank uh, Professor McIntosh for, for for leading this session the way he's done. I love the fact that we went to the Word, looked at the Word. That is the authority that we as believers hold to, and and um, showing us that everything comes together there on the cross, where the Lord Jesus Christ died for us. So. Um, thank you so much for that. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that even though sometimes our minds cannot get around some of these facts, we do have a reliable source. The very word of God, as you spoke the world into existence, we have an historical document that lead us through the whole history of mankind and that we can trace these things back through archaeology, we can look at the realities of life, the very fact that we die, but most of all that we can look at Christ and see in Him a Savior, the very Word of God that came to save sinners. And we are looking forward to the new heavens and the new earth where it seems that time will, will, will not even play a role. We will be in the very presence of our God where the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ would illuminate everything. We are looking forward to eternity, to get to know a God who is infinite, who is powerful. And in the, ma in the manner in which you have created, we will see how that all plays out in a world without sin, in the presence of our Lord. I, I pray that we will have that hope alive in us, you will equip our young people now as they live and all of us to be able to stand on what the word of God says. We praise your holy name. Amen.